Hello, welcome and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Kaitel, recording today from Los Angeles, where it's even sunnier and even hotter than it usually is. Joining me on the call, as always, is my co-host, Joe, who's back in our hometown of London. Hiya, Joe. Hi, Kaitel. Good to be chatting again. First time we've done one of these in a while. So, yeah, excited to get going, really. Absolutely. We do, as usual, as well, have a special guest for the podcast. He's joining us from Senegal, which is a first out of the 97 guests that we've had on this pod so far. But 97 will be a very unimpressive number for today's guest, however, as he was part of the infamous Reading side that smashed the 100-point barrier to gain promotion to the Premier League under Steve Koppel back in 2006. Having played in France before then, our guest would go on to play for a few more famous English clubs and then make the move to Turkish football until rounding out his playing career with a return to the English game, this time at a non-league level. Four years on from hanging up his playing boots, he's worked as a pundit and runs a football academy back in his native Senegal, as well as an agency for up-and-coming footballers needing representation. We welcome Ibrahima Sonko to the United Mates Football Podcast. Ibrahima, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the pod with us, and how is it going, mate? I'm all good, I'm all good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure, as I was saying. Um, Joe, as we record, we're only six games into the new Premier League season. Ibrahim, I'm sure you've had your eyes on, on that football as well. My beloved Arsenal sit at the top of the table just about with City and Joe, your lot Spurs just a point behind in second and third. If the season ended today, though, Joe, would, would you take that? I mean, third place has got to be, I'd imagine, the best pretty much you'd have ever done in the Prem, but it, it would be at the expense of Arsenal winning the league. So, uh, yay or nay? Oh, well, we have finished second before, so that we have we have done that. But um, sure you've made a DVD about that one. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, no, I can't, can't have Arsenal winning the league, so no. But, I mean, you did lose to Manu on the weekend, so hopefully the bubble has, um, has burst. We shall see. We shall see. But, yeah, good start for Tottenham. I cannot complain. Um, it's an exciting time to be a Tottenham fan, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, Ibrahima, whenever we have a guest on our podcast, we always start by asking an icebreaker question, just something a bit silly, really. We typically will we'll go through our guest's social media account, we'll find something, not too incriminating. And we'll, uh, we'll ask them a question. So having looked on your um, Twitter account, Ibrahima, we can see that you um, you posted a tweet with the caption, they say we all got a double in life somewhere. And it's an image of um, the late actor Robin Williams and someone from, I think, Britain's Got Talent, who looks quite similar to him. Um, so we're going to give you time to answer this, Ibrahima. But what we want to ask you is... Um, who have you been told is your lookalike, or who? Um, yeah, who? Who have you been told is your doppelganger, as it were? Um, your your lookalike. Um, Kai, I'll ask you first. Um, who is your lookalike or doppelganger? We're talking football. I, you know, heard all of the skulls and whatnot when I was a kid, but that was more kind of jokingly. Although honestly, when I was a kid and I did have shorter hair, Steve Sidwell, one of Ibrahima's former teammates, I, I looked quite a bit like, to be fair. Um, if we're taking it away from football, though, just a name that people have told me that I look like. There's a, a rapper called uh, Lil Dicky. I wish that wasn't his name, but um, people tell me I look like Lil Dicky. Uh, Joe, I, I seem to remember you getting called out as, as Roman Pavlyuchenko uh, once upon a time back in the day. But besides him, who, who's your doppelganger? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Pavlyuchenko, I think it was just because he had blonde hair and I did and I was a Tottenham fan. I think that was where I mean, I, I did love Roman Pavlyuchenko back in the day to be fair, so I'll take it. Uh, I don't know, insert any generic person with a beard and blonde hair. I can't, we'll stick with Roman Pavlichenko, you know, for the time being, even though I probably don't look anything like him now. Um, Ibrahima, you've had a little bit of time to think. Is, is there anyone that you're often told that you look a lot like? Um, I would say a bit younger. I was, I was a bit wider, obviously, in my playing days and everything. And um, I used to love the shirt with, uh, you know, with no sleeves and everything. And I used to, I used to love like to show my arms and everything, you know, my tattoos and everything. And I always had uh, short hair, gold head, and people used to say, "You look like Tyree." From the Fast and Furious movies, he's a good singer as well. That's not, that's not a bad one. I think he's. I mean, I'm sure he's must have won like sexiest man on earth at some point. Like the, the ladies definitely love Tyrese, so you, you could be doing worse than uh, than Tyrese Gibson, to be fair. Um, 
So yeah, but if it comes to football, I think uh, people used to compare me to Darren Moore. You know, I mean the big, big, big fella. You know, bullhead. You know, and just you know, yeah. So. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, and I remember Joe telling you quite excitedly that I bumped into Darren Moore and the rest of the Derby squad. I think it was uh, Luton Airport <laughs> once upon a time, where I think that was pre-season for that infamous... Um, how many points did they get that year, Joe? Oh, it was... Did they even make double points? Uh, like eight or double points figures? Like that. Anyway, so you've got yeah. a much more kind of um, well-established Premier League career than, than Darren Moore. No disrespect to big Darren. Um, but anyway, moving on from lookalikes and uh, sticking with football, um, with all of our guests, we, we like to get an understanding of how football became such a big part of their lives in the first place. Um, I started playing it uh, at school to kind of fit in with, with a new friend group. Joe has some professional football heritage, as uh, Mourinho would say, in, in his family. Um, but Ibrahima, what is your football origin story, so to speak? I know your cousins with one of my favourite former Arsenal players, Bakary Sanya. Did, uh, did you two play together back in, in France? Basically, you know, what are your early memories of, of watching, playing and supporting football, Ibrahima? Yeah, back, back is quite, yeah, he's about six years younger than me, so uh, we didn't have chance to play with, uh, in the same team or anything like that, you know what I mean? But um, yeah, no, I think, well, from my parents' point of view, you know, I started walking before, because of the football, you know, I was uh, back in Senegal when I was born and I meant for holiday and uh, I was still little and uh, the, the boys were playing in, a, in the courtyard and the ball rolled up to me and I hold the ball and that's when I first stood up because I used the ball as a stand, standing, you know, to stand up and everything. But yeah, that's my parents' point of view. And, uh, and me, I think it's just like one of these things, you know, like... Uh, I spent two years in Senegal between the time I was born and uh, and the time I moved back to France, you know, and everyone played football in, in Senegal. It's like the kids, that's all we do is football, 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 football. So when I went back to France, automatically I was like about four years old. And uh, my dad said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to play football. And uh, yeah, that's how it started. You know, I started in, uh, in a suburb of Paris and then uh, from there, try to move up the ladder fantastic yeah and you I mean you wanted to do something and you certainly went and did it but um let's actually talk about um your early career Ibrahima so I know you sort of you were in the academy at a couple of teams um and but then you'd start your professional career at Grenoble and you'd um you'd get promotion from the third tier which I think is the championnat national and then you'd play a, a year in the second tier as well Ligue 2 um, but then you'd make the move, obviously, over to England for the first time to play for Brentford. So my question is, Ibrahima, how do you compare the standard of what was then Division Two in England when you were at Brentford compared to when you were playing for Grenoble in a Championnat National and Ligue 2? Oh, yeah. It's, um, what would I say? Uh, in National, um, I mean, the level now has gone up because you've got more people from, uh, from like, good good like formation, like PSG and everyone, people who can't make it to the top directly, they go back down to try to uh, to play as much as they can and gain uh, experience. But at the time, at the time, it was like totally different because it was like proper men who have not made it, you know, playing in that game. There was no really young people playing there. But I was lucky because I was at Grenoble, the manager liked me, and I, I was bigger than everyone anyway. You know, so that was a that was a plus. And uh, I remember in National, uh, the the first time the the left back got injured, he looked on the bench. I was the only defender. He took he stuck me as the right as the left back, and I went on eight match. And after eight match, the left back came back, but the captain, I remember, Elze Milazzo told the coach, "You can't take him out. He's been doing well, and he's a kid. He needs to carry on playing. You know, I mean, you have to give him a chance." So the kid, uh, the the manager set up the team around me a little bit, you know, like he took one of the defenders out, put him in the midfield, you know, tried to fit me in, and then we went on and uh, literally won the league. So uh, that was good. That was good. Then uh, when I went to the second division, it was a different experience, you know, the player were a bit better and everything. So as much as I play about, I think about 14 games, 15 games started, and I was on the bench a lot, you know, I mean, it was a learning curve for me because. 
yeah, he was sharper. He was like proper, proper good level. And um, yeah, so uh, if I have to compare it to Grenoble, or to sorry, to Brentford, I would say that at the time, at the time, Ligue 2 in France was better than Ligue One in uh, than Ligue One in uh, in England. You know, much better because in France, literally, the way we play football now in England, you know, the ball on the field, you know, like on the floor, passing the ball, and everything, it was already done in France because that's how. At football school, they teach you how to play, and uh, and when I went to Brentford, I realized that it was more for, more like an athletic game, you know, long balls and you know fighting for the second ball. So the game was a bit more suited for me. You know, I didn't have, I wouldn't say that I'm not skillful at all, but my skills wasn't good enough at the time for France and the way football was played. So uh, yeah, Brentford was a better the places for me, England, I would say, was the better the places for me. And then when I realized that, yeah, you know what, I probably got a chance here to reach the top. And I wouldn't say that if I was in front, I wouldn't, but it would have been more difficult, I think, for me, you know, because the requirement when it comes to the ball playing, contrabacks and everything, I wasn't there yet. You know, I would have took probably longer to achieve it. But uh, yeah, I, in England, I was, yeah, I just needed to be strong very good defender and that's all you needed at the time when I was playing now it's different ball I don't think I would be playing for Man City but uh, <laughs> or Arsenal but uh, yeah at the time when I was playing I feel like the physicality of the game was the most important part of English game. Well it, it certainly seems like um, yeah the move to England suited you because obviously after a couple of seasons in West London you'd get um you get the move to Reading. Um, and this is obviously where um, you were part of that fantastic team that obviously got 106 points um, and would go on to actually be brilliant in the Premier League in that first season as well. But I guess my question for you, Ibrahima, is in your first season at Reading, you finished seventh, so just outside the playoffs, but then in that next year would go on to absolutely destroy the league, as everybody knows. What... Um, what was different, do you think, between that team and your first year at Reading compared to the second one? Well, when I first got to Reading, I think it was Eva Inga Marston and A.T. Williams playing. And uh, I remember when I was at Brentford, I went to West Reading play with Anthony Rouget and, uh, and I fell in love with the team. And I was saying to Anthony at the time, you know, we were doing bad at Brentford and we, we escaped relegation. And the season, I mean, the second part of the season went better for me than the first part. I was saying, like, you know what, I would love to play at that ground one day. And he told me, you know what, anything can happen, you never know. And I was lucky enough that because Wally Down went to Brentford, sorry, from Brentford to uh, to Reading with Keith Coppel. And uh, I think that facilitated the move because after the season finished at Brentford, uh, I had an offer from uh, Leicester at the time. They were just coming back down from the Premier League. And I remember David Bassett contacting me, trying to sign me. I actually went to Leicester and I was about to put like, pen to paper. And my agent called me saying, have you signed? I said, no. He said, don't sign. Wally wants you. And I went, because I knew Wally down and you were really close. He's the first one to give him a shot at Brentford. So I thought, okay, where is that? They reading. And I, like, I went like, oh, that's the team I want to play for. You know, and uh, literally I didn't think twice. I just told them, listen, and I just had this afternoon to think about it. And I took my car and I just went off. I just disappeared, literally. And the next day, in the morning, I signed. And I remember David Bassett calling me and literally, not swearing, but he wasn't far from it, telling me, why well, you think we should be, you will never make it. You know, I mean, you know, obviously, he was annoyed, so I can understand, you know what I mean? And it was up to me to go and prove him wrong. And uh, it was a good move at Reading, really. I mean, there was more money at Leicester at the time. But Reading, I don't know, for some reason, is the club I saw and I wanted to play for. And Wally Down going there, I thought, if Wally is there, you know, he will push out, he will push for me. If I do everything at training, he will push for me to play. You know, so, yeah, I took the chance and it went, it went good. Uh, that first year was, you know, we, I had to wait for A.D. Williams to get injured before I get in the team. When I got in the team, it was a bit, yeah, it was, it was good. Defensively, it was okay. But then once again, it was a step higher from Brentford. You needed to play better football and everything. And you couldn't ask me that because I was stressed for most of the 
season, you know, like, you know, like first time in that league, you know, and you, you've been tested. I knew physically I was good, but I had doubts about my fit, which I shouldn't because I was part of the French formation. But for some reason, they told me so many times, your feet are no good, your feet are no good in front, but I ended up believing, you know. And uh, yeah, I had to settle down. Steve Cop was to talk to me a lot, telling me, uh, just relax, you know, I mean, you're better than you think. You do it at training, so why, why are you scared in game to hold the ball and things like that? So I had to actually grow in confidence and everything. And uh, what triggered the second season, on my point of view, is, um, is that when we went to Wigan on the final day of the, league, of the league, and Wigan needed to beat us to go, up, to go straight up, and we needed to beat Wigan to be in a, in, a, in a playoff. And literally within 30 minutes, we were 3-0 down. You know, we went, uh, yeah, no, we went, uh, we went there and literally they smashed us. You know, Jason Roberts and uh, Nathan Ellington were just like unstoppable, you know. And, uh, and we ended up again 3-1. They got promoted and Steve Coppo said, we all coming out. They're going to come out. We applaud them. We stay there, you know, and watch the celebration, you know. You know, that's the respect we should have to show them because they had a good season. At first, we didn't want to, obviously, you know, we miss out on the playoff and then they're celebrating. So you're thinking, you know, you don't want to do that. Then you went outside, you know, they came out, they were happy. You see the joy, the fans and all that thing, you know, literally, I think that did drive something in us, you know, like we were all watching it and uploading and everything. And then we finish and Steve Cooper, before we go in the dressing room, went like, that could be us next year. And literally, we all like, literally, I think because we lived there for a week and we thought, you know, we want to leave something like that as well. But we didn't think we were going to go and like literally smash the season. We just thought we're going to fight to get at least promoted. You know, it doesn't matter the way, but we just have to get promoted. Obviously, you start the new season. We did extremely well in pre-season. First game of the season is uh, playing more at home. We got beat 2-1. <laughs> So you come in out in and you you come back in. The manager is looking at us, thinking like, "All right, unlucky, um, but uh, we need the reaction from Tuesday." And this is the good thing about championship: is like you lose one on Saturday, you got Tuesday to put this, you know, right, you know, and that's that's good. So uh, it's a you have to put this right on Tuesday because if not, we're gonna be struggling. And uh, yeah, and from there we start winning the first one, the second one, drew the third one. And then even the biggest team, we just came back down, like Stoke City, Southampton. We start thinking, like, you know, we, we probably can do it, you know. Uh, Southampton just came back down. We, we drew at their place. You know, they had uh, some good players there as well. At the time, Nigel Kashi, they had a cinema, I forget his name. A big Jamaican player who used to be at Stoke with me as well. I forget his name, Ricardo. Yeah. Ricardo Fila, yeah, exactly. You know, Ken Win Jones. They really had a good team, you know. And uh, yeah, we ended up drawing at their place. You know, we struggled all game, but we had the draw. And then we went on one, two, three, and 30. And we like, damn, you know, I mean, 30 games late after the first one, we have not been unbeaten. And we started thinking, you know, well, we could probably try to do an Arsenal thing, you know, I mean, going on the season without getting beat again. And uh, unfortunately, on the 33rd one, we lost at Luton. You know, uh, you know, free to. Um, then we thought, okay, it's not a problem now. It's just about promotion because we were in a good place. And then we went on and went on. And I think in March, in March we played Leicester, and uh, from that game there was about eight games left, and we got promoted. You know, and then when we got promoted, the manager say, we are, we have to show respect to the league because there is a lot of people still playing in the league and playing for the position. So we have to finish the league the way we started the league. And then we were like, you know what, we want to go and beat any record we can beat. You know, so we were going after anything, you know, like every single point we wanted, you know. And then we went on, on, on the last game of the season knowing that we beat QPR, we beat, uh, we, we're going to beat uh, the record from uh, Sunderland, you know, 1105, I think they used to. And uh, yeah, so we went there. Got 99 goals, only 24 goals conceded, 24 clean sheets. It was just a, 
fabulous season, you know, like if nothing you can say, but like I say, what trigger it, I think is that deception we had at Wigan, you know, and at the same time, you know, they were we were happy for them because we had friends there playing. But obviously on our side it was just like, you know what, we need that kind of emotion, just like them. It's always impressive when you can use a disappointing moment as a as a learning moment, as a, as a springboard to kind of um, build new success off, off of. Obviously, yeah, congratulations to Wigan from that season prior. You mentioned the likes of Jason Roberts and, and Nathan Ellington. It, you know, it didn't hurt either that you had players like Leroy Lita and, you know, um, Shane Long and Dave Kitson and Kevin Doyle as well, firing you guys uh, towards promotion. Um the, the following season and it sounds like yeah mentality had a had a big part to play in that and that probably Steve Koppel was was the right guy to kind of get you guys into that positive headspace um to push for that success and for that record breaking 106 uh points which you went on to achieve and of course that earned you the right to play in the Premier League the following season um which would have been you know quite a time to be a Reading player quite a time to be associated with the club whatsoever um but speaking you know, towards the experience you had on the pitch in the Premier League, who who was the most difficult player for you as a defender to come up against in that first season? Who who gave you the hardest time? It's a uh, it's, it's a funny one because uh, I always say that at the time the one who annoyed me the most was probably Olegana Scholcher, but I think he was because the manager because the manager decided to play us as a 1v1 situation all around the pitch. Everyone had the player and uh, we had to mark him. And Solskjaer was just annoying me because he was taking me places that I didn't want to go. So he realized after five, 10 minutes that I was following everywhere. And literally the ball was in front of my goal. And uh, I'm having to watch everything happening from the, mid from the middle of the pitch. You know, so I was out of position all the time. He's just like literally looking at me and say, are you following me? I say, I'm marking you. Okay, and he starts just walking away from the ball, and like you tempted that going to 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 the, to the ball to help your teammate, but then he, you're gonna let him free. They said, "No, stay with your man, stay with your man." And I ended up like for literally 30 minutes, and the only time I decided to go and help someone, he went in the box and scored. <laughs> lucky, lucky we got a free kick just behind, and I ended up scoring. So pretty level, and then literally gone gone back on him, and I asked him, I literally. Asked the manager to stop that. I went like, I can't do it. You know, I can't just following everywhere because I'm not playing my football. I'm, I am I feel like I'm lost and everything. So it was the most annoying one on the day. But the one with the most quality, I would say that it was Berbatov at Tottenham. He was, uh, he, uh, he had everything. He had like literally everything. I did not know how to stop him. You know, uh, Torres, you know, Liverpool, you thought, okay, if I can close down the space, you know, he can't run. And I was quite quick at the time, so he was okay, you know. Uh, Drogba was strong, but I wasn't bad as well. So he was a good fight, you know. Uh, when Rune at United, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, Cristiano was playing on a, in a, on a, right, on a right side, so uh, he's different to Cristiano, but when Rune was strong as well, but Berbatov, Berbatov was just like literally, um, literally, uh, literally like one of the best I, I met on the pitch. You know, you know, he's one of the best I met on the pitch. He was strong. He, he had very good feet. You know, he had the size. He had everything. And you know, I, I remember that that year we played Tottenham at Tottenham, and we ended up drawing. We ended up. Uh, uh, we ended up drawing the game. We ended up drawing the game. Um, no, we ended up losing the game seven four, and I think he scored. He, he scored literally. Sorry, I put it as because I've got people coming in. Yeah, we ended up losing seven four that game, and he scored four goals. You know, so I, I would remember. say that. He's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What a game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he's, he's the most difficult player I have played against because I did not know what to do with him. Was there a performance? It doesn't sound like it was maybe the one against um, Berbatov or, or, or the one against Solskjaer, but was there a performance against a, a team or an individual that you were particularly proud of that you were able to make it through, you know, 90 minutes or so without conceding or kind of you managed to pocket a really top draw striker? Um, yeah, is there any 
one game in particular that you look back upon and you can be very proud of from your time in the Premier League personally? From our time in Premier League, I think we had some amazing strikers in the Premier League, like literally like amazing strikers, you know, Torres, Drogba, Wen Rune, you know, and Gabatov. You know, really, it was just, uh, yeah, it was just a fabulous year for football in England, you know, so... I mean, we lost against United, we drew against United at home, lost away, but when the Rangers didn't score, so I was happy. <laughs> uh, we, we lost against uh, Chelsea, you know, it was on Drogba who scored, you know, and uh, we had like literally uh, the light of like, um, oh yeah, Kevin Phillips was still playing, you know, honestly, I do think that all school strikers, you know, all them lot were better than the strikers we have today in the league. That's that's my opinion, you know. And even like when we played Arsenal, I mean, like they beat us 4 0 at Reading, and that was a great experience. We end up going to the Emirates and doing well and like literally win the game, you know. So it's it's one of these things, you know. We uh, we enjoyed every experience with all the players we played against, and. Uh, it was just amazing and yeah that's uh that's yeah that's a golden moment for us sounds like enjoying and living in the moment probably helped you guys uh, along that way just in terms of the positive mentality and um inevitably when you are enjoying your football you know things are probably going to go better than if you're stressing out about the results week in week out so that first season was quite a success in the in the premier league moving on to the second season that you had in the top flight Apart from my childhood look like Steve Sidwell uh, leaving, I think Chelsea would have picked him up at that point. And he was instrumental, you know, middle of the park, central midfielder. Was losing a player like Steve Sidwell something that really hurt Reading in that season? Or were there kind of bigger issues behind the scenes? What, what can you sort of explain the difference between the success in the first season and then ultimately the relegation in the, the following season? Well, um... We started the, the second season with a win against uh, Middlesbrough at home. I mean, we were 2 0 down and we turned it around and won the game 3 2. You know, I was, yeah, uh, Southgate was playing at the time, you know what I mean? And, and people like that. And uh, I remember we uh, we came in half time losing, you know, to uh, Mark Viduka and, you know, all them people, you know, uh, Tun Chai and, yeah. So we were losing 2-0 and uh, literally Steve Koppel went, welcome to the Premier League guys. And we were like looking at each other thinking like, damn, this is going to be a tough season because they were miles better than us, you know, and keeping the ball around. We were running a lot behind the ball. So it was difficult. And then literally Steve Koppel told us one thing, say, you've been successful in the championship because you were playing your game, but now you're trying to play someone else's game, you know, and that's not going to work for you. You have to bring the championship to the Premier League and show them that it's all about, you know, quick, quick con contra attack, you know, and literally big fight on the pitch. You know, just mess up your day game. Don't play like they want to play. They leave you the ball. You leave them the ball. You know, be more aggressive, you know, and just put the ball behind them. They won't like it. And that's what we did. We came out second half and literally we went one, two, three, won the game and. Uh, and from there, we started believing that we can do it. You know, we started believing that if we keep our real identity in the second season, in the first season of Premier League, we could do it. But then I went to get injured in January. I went to get injured. Uh, it was a very bad time for me because I was doing extremely well in the Premier League. I remember, I mean, Sidwell went to Chelsea, but at the time, at the time, Mourinho, you know, that's because... I met Drogba on the pitch, we took exchange number, and Mourinho had an idea of signing me and making an offer to Reading after that game against Chelsea. And uh, where two went on, even the people from Reading were telling me that Man United proposed to sign me as well at the time. You know, so, but I got injured, I done my ligaments, and I was out for eight months. Then, uh, what's his name? We lost Sidwell as well, so there was already like two people who have played every single game for two, two, three years for Reading, out uh, out there, you know, not playing and everything. And uh, and I think the second, the syndrome of the second season as well. I think everyone knew a little bit of what we were about, you know. And um, yeah, more, 
I would say also some egos a little bit. We probably thought we were better than we were probably at the time. And uh, yeah, it didn't work out. And by the time I came back, I think we were in a bad position. Then I went to the African Cup of Nations for Senegal. Then I came back and then uh, at that point we were yeah, pretty much done. You know, and then I had a problem with the club, so I didn't finish the season either. So yeah, it just went the same way it went so good for a few years. In one season, everything went so bad. And yeah, we ended up going back down. You know, and from there, I parted away with the club going to Stoke, you know, and more people started leaving. But yeah, the the boys who were below, you know, information at the time, at the time where we were playing, came in and, you know, and put the smile back at Reading's fan. Yeah, I guess all good things must come to an end and that fantastic Reading, Reading team did well for so many years. But unfortunately, yeah, it didn't, didn't quite work out in that second season. But um, that did obviously lead to a new opportunity for you Ibrahima you'd go to Stoke in their first season in the Premier League and um, they were obviously managed by Tony Pulis he'd previously been managed by Steve Koppel I think they seem like quite different personalities so how different was it playing um under Tony Pulis compared to Steve Koppel well it's like I don't know uh the world now people are driving electric cars and, uh, you know, the old quiet, you understand? I mean, the old quiet, nice and everything, but they still very effective. And on the other side, like having a, a, a V6, you know, like as soon as you press, press the pedal, everything is like all noise and everything. And that was two different characters. Steve Koppel was so quiet, you know, and he always had the right word. I think he only, only lost it one time you know, in my four years of playing for him. And that was, uh, we played, uh, who was he again? Oh, strangely, again, he was playing move away. We played play move away and uh, we were losing two and a half time and literally he went in and that was the first time I heard Steve Koppel swearing. You know, but we, we weren't playing and literally us getting direction from him, uh, drivers to go and get the draw in the second half, you know. But it was the first time I saw a couple literally shouting at us. And on the other side, yes, Tony Pulis, you know, whom you can hear on the side of the pitch with like 60,000 fans, you can still hear it. <laughs> you know, so, but uh, yeah, two different managers. Tony Pulis was all about tactics and um, he was very working on tactics, 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 tactics and nothing else. You know, uh, and uh, on the other side, Steve Copper was more about like literally, we have a style of play. You know, we're gonna adapt to what how they play, but we're gonna play that way as well. You know, and every game could be different. This team is like that, it's like that. So this is the way we're gonna be playing. And yeah, so it was different, but it was really educative for me. It's interesting that. You mentioned there uh, about Steve Koppel kind of having the the Reading identity. Of course, you're going to approach different games differently against different teams. But from my perspective as as an Arsenal fan and maybe from other Premier League football fans who were kind of uh, rudely surprised by some of the success that Stoke did have early on in in the Premier League. And a lot of that came down to the atmosphere at the Britannia Stadium, but then also Tony Pulis and Stoke's tactical approach, which seemed like anti-football isn't necessarily the right word because there were some good footballers in that team. Um, Dean uh, Whitehead, Liam Lawrence, um, uh, Glenn Whelan, like they could all get the ball around the pitch quite well. But beyond that, obviously, Rory DeLapp's long throws were a bit of a, a, a big part of um, some of the goal scoring in particular that, that Stoke had uh, that season. Did it, Again, from the outside, seemed like Tony Pulis was literally probably, you know, on the training ground preparing you guys to make life difficult for the opposition. Did he, did he give you instructions to specifically kind of rile up the other team? Because the gap in technical quality might have been between your, the likes of Stoke and Arsenal and City, um, a bit of a big gap. Did he tell you guys to kind of upset the opposition players? Actually, he never did something like that. Is, uh, yeah, uh, I know people were saying like we were aggressive and everything, but I think we just like it's literally like you know you've got dogs, you know. I mean, if you're an aggressive person, your dog will be aggressive. You understand what I mean? And us having Tony Police always being aggressive on the on the side of the pitch at training, 
you know, literally when he wants something, he would scream, what are you doing? Get in there, you know, and everything. So literally, you just play the football he wants without literally him having to say, you know, go and smash someone. He just say, why did you not get the ball? Why did you not get it? You know, I don't understand. It's a 1v1, Is you know, it's you against him. Why don't you get the ball? And like literally you fall on an extra challenge, I make sure I get it because if not, it's going to be on my case. And that's the way we used to play football. We were just literally one-sided team. The goalkeeper got it. Everyone goes up in one corner. We get the second ball, you know, and literally second ball is not even, it's, it's, if we can, it's have a touch, it goes wide for a cross. If not, just put it back in. You know, the defenders, we weren't allowed to play from the back. It was just, no, we got it. Channel ball, or if not across the pitch for the big fella. That was only that, you know. But that's that's Tony Police way of playing, and you know you adapt to it. At first, I, I mean, for someone who's not that technical, I thought it was still strange to play only that kind of football, you know. Because with Steve Copper, literally, you express yourself slightly a bit more. You know, you still guide it on what you're doing and how you do it because you do exactly the same thing. But it seems like a Steve Coppola was playing a bit more. And uh, with, with uh, police, it wasn't the case. It was just like, literally, this is the way I want to play. I want to put pressure on the team. I want to play high up the pitch. I want all the second balls literally to go back in. You know, and literally, you know, it's just like, yeah, yeah, you just have to grind them until they literally give up. And that's the spirit we had with them for many years. That's why he did well. Uh, it's not far from Samaradais, if you think about it. And uh, it's, he wasn't far from Shandai's, you know, for years in, at Burnley as well. And they got success from it. And because he was saying that every single team who gone up from Championship to the Premier League, as soon as they start showing the identity, they fell. And literally, he went on with six, seven, eight seasons at Stoke, doing well in the Premier League. Shandai did the same thing and he did well. And soon as people start shunning a little bit, and yeah, the, the result goes the wrong way. So yeah, that's how they know. That's how uh, they were as a manager. Who can blame them? They were so successful, you know, for them, for themselves, and for their team. So yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, if it don't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Clearly, uh, Tony Pula sub- subscribed to that, and he he managed to put Stoke on the map in a in a big way in those early seasons in the in the Premier League. And you and your teammates definitely managed to make life difficult for a lot of really, really good footballing sides along the way. Um, while you were at Stoke under contract, you had a couple of loans to, uh, to Hull City, to, to, to Portsmouth as well, some, some more big clubs. I know in particular at, at Portsmouth, it was kind of a, a, you know, a difficult time. You mentioned nearly joining Leicester once upon a time. I know they had to go way, way down to come back up. Portsmouth are, you know, still in the midst of, of coming back after having um, suffered financially off the pitch and that that led to results on the pitch, kind of taking them down the football league a bit. Um, but but after your time with Stoke came to an end, you would join Port, uh, sorry, uh, Ipswich rather, at Portman Road, I was going to say, uh, for a season. And then beyond that, you would move to Turkey and sign for, I'm going to try to say this properly, uh, Akisar Belediaspor. Um, that's probably as close as I'm going to get. I think I think you understood what I was saying, but um, you'd spend three seasons there. And so I've got just a few quick fire questions for you now about that experience of, of life and football in, in Turkey. So it's kind of a this or that, um, just whichever one you prefer, you can shout out. So Ibrahima, Turkish coffee or English tea? I would say English tea. English tea, there you go. I actually, I, I like that really strong Turkish stuff. It's like, it's like black tar almost in just like a little, little cup and it, it kind of, yeah, caffeine levels in there are through the roof. Um, sticking with kind of food related stuff, actually, the next couple of these are going to be down that route. Uh, Turkish delight or trifle. Did you ever come across trifle during your time in England? Uh, I did, I did. I, I would, I mean, as much as Turkish delight is too sugary for me, I will go for Turkish delight. Turkish delight. Okay. All right. So it's kind of one all right now in terms of England versus <laughs> Turkey in this game. Um, let's see if we can uh, tip the scale one way or another. Baklava or back of the net? What's better? That pistachio, honey, phyllo, delicious pastry dessert or scoring a goal? I think scoring a goal. Okay. 
So back of the net over Baklava. Fair enough. <laughs> and then just one controversial one, I guess, to end on, even though you didn't play for either of them. Let's go with uh, Galatasaray or Fenerbahce. Tough one. Tough one. Uh, I, I would... I would go for, for Gala. Galatasaray. Okay. Very cool. I know one of your mates, Abue, played uh, Androgba as well. Would have both been on uh, yeah. Galatasaray for a, for a bit. Yeah. I guess just nice. before um, we move on to one more question about kind of like life in Turkey, briefly, could you explain the difference between we've spoken about France and England? Uh, how about England and Turkey? What would the major difference between the style of football be in those two nations? Oh, wow, uh, there is too many difference between them two. Uh, uh, first, the way they approach the game, the way they train, everything is so different, you know, it's all, everything is so like relaxed, you know, you go for like about 10 years in England where like everything is about, you have to train hard, you have to work hard, you have to, you know, you have to grind, you have to do this and that and this. And then you come to Turkey, they say, oh, relax. <laughs> you know, you literally get the ball, and like literally put it in the channel, the striker is looking at you thinking, why are you doing that? Just put it in my feet. But you're going to lose it. It doesn't matter. You know, it's okay. It's life. That's how they see it. And uh, I remember when I first came to Akisar, I came with the mentality of England. You know, literally, uh, the ball is there. If I don't no solution, put it in the channel, try to hit the striker. And uh, the manager came to me after the first two training sessions. He went, no, 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 we don't do that. And I'm like, don't do what say here. When you don't have a solution, you go back to the keeper. I'm like, okay. And what? And he said, yeah, and you go wide and you get the ball again. And I went like, I'm not sure I can do that. He said, yeah, you can do it. So we watch you play. That's why we sign you. We know you can do it. And I'm like, so it took me about two, three weeks, you know, to literally think, okay, you know what? He's probably right. I can do it. You know what I mean? But uh, before that, before that, it was just a shambles. I feel like, I don't get it. I mean, like, literally, just, there is space behind the defense. We can put it there and strike it and run, but they don't want to play like that. They just want to play football. They want the ball to be moving and midfielders come in and get it, give it back to you and everything and back and forth. And I'm like, okay, this is a different kind of football and everything, but, you know, you have to adapt to it. So, yeah, Turkey, Turkey was a very mild, relaxed time for me. And after all them, the last three years I had in England, it was good to be there. It was the right place for me at the right time, I think. That's, yeah, that's good to hear. It was um, a sort of relaxed time for you, because I guess coming on to our next question, it was more about actually, I mean, this happens in England, unfortunately, as well, but in Turkish football, sometimes there is there does seem to be a culture of racism there. So, I mean, even I remember on the pitch, Didier Zakora was racially abused by Emre, the Turkish player. And I know sometimes Turkish fans um, haven't always covered themselves in glory when it's come to um, racism. So I, I guess my question for you was, um, Ibrahima, during your time playing in Turkey, did you suffer from any racial abuse from the fans or, or was, it, was the experience of playing in Turkey no different to playing um, in the English league? I think, I think it, was, it was just... No difference, really. I think it's one of these things. Your fans love you. The other fans hate you. It's one of these things. So sometimes we talk about racism in football. And I'm, I'm not saying that people are not. I'm just saying that sometimes we give them too much importance, if you know what I mean. I think like sometimes we just have to say, you know, well, you don't want to be there. Don't be there. But, you know what I mean? Don't just call people names. And when they do, it's just to make sure that you're not in the game again anymore. They just want to make sure that you come out of the game, you focus on something else, you get annoyed, you get upset. So you don't, I mean, how many times, I mean, I apologize, I don't know, probably some kids are gonna, gonna listen to what I say, but how many times have I been called a thin C word, you know what I mean, in England, you know, on the pitch by other players or by the fans? It's as bad as calling me a N word, you know what I mean? In reality, it's just them trying to put me off of my game. And if I enter in that kind of mind, oh, he's racist and everything, we end up, we end up actually walking into a trap, really, you know. Uh, I'm not saying people are not racist, you know what I mean? But when they racially abuse an opponent, 
I think sometimes it's just to make sure that the opponent gets annoyed. You know, and it's not obvious, not it's not saying it's not racist. I'm just saying that they're trying to find a way to get you out of your game. It's not they just want to be racist to you. They don't know you. They don't know you. They don't, they don't have to like you. And them calling you a C word or them calling you N word is the same thing to them. They don't realize what they say. You know, they just want to say something to make sure that you're annoyed and you don't play anymore. And uh, and this is why we need to make the difference. You know, uh, you go at Tottenham. You know, I mean, uh, Sol Campbell, when he was playing at Tottenham, everyone loved him. He went on the other side, they say Judah. I mean, you go to to uh, Barcelona, Figo was playing there. He went on the other side, he's been called them. You know, so we should be careful when we say that people in football are racist. I'm not saying there is no racism in the football. I'm just saying we have to be careful. We have to be careful and not give that too much importance, especially when the race is not towards your own player because I played for some teams and I'm sure that my fans love me but they will probably call the N-word another guy was playing for the Tottenham because they don't like the team they play for. You know, Arsenal, Tottenham, big problem between the two teams. And if today the a Tottenham fan called uh, Saka uh, N-word, it's not, I don't think it's because he's racist because he, he loves the players at Tottenham, the black ones, you know what I mean? It's just because it's just it's, it's the game, it's the way they are. They they want to be in it. They want to upset the other guy. You know what I mean? They're trying to put you off, and so they say word. Unfortunately, there is word, but we should not say. But when they come out, you have to put it into the context. You know what I mean? Don't just shout he's racist. You know, don't just shout he's racist. Yeah, he made a mistake. Okay, he made a mistake, and that's it. That's sometimes something I've got a big problem in football because people are like, oh, yeah, he called me the N-word, he's, that, he's racist and everything. No, my mate. He managed to do what he wanted to do to make sure that you're out of your game and you're focusing on him. That's all. You know, but, um, yeah, it, that's my opinion. That's, uh, yeah, that was, that will remain my opinion. Uh, it's a good point about kind of the, the tribal nature of, football fans in in particular not to excuse any of the behavior but like you said it's kind of a, a means to an end in terms of putting off the opponent and making them feel unwelcome in a stadium or making them feel like they can't play their best game um when it filters i suppose just thinking of an incident between players joe obviously mentioned emre and zakora in england we had the whole um issue with uh, with Luis Suarez and P Patrice Evra that's kind of a, a different situation you'd like to think that fellow athletes can respect each other enough to not have to stoop to that level but as you also mentioned these are the same guys that would call you an effing c-word like it was nothing so um, it, it's a it, it's a part of the game that could probably be improved on but maybe it just needs to be seen as what it is which is for the time being a part a part of the game un unfortunately yeah. um you know, as they say in basketball, it's trash talk. That's all. Nothing else. Probably a bit more rude, but it's still trash talk. It's nothing else. Yeah. And the referees, you know, if someone wants to send out a message and penalize it, or if the head of referees at the beginning of a season says, this is something that we want to clamp down on, then that's something that they, they can, you know, maybe do on, on the pitch. But until then, um, yeah, the way the football kind of ecosystem is set up, this, this happens uh, on, on kind of a game to game. Uh, basis but moving away from from Turkey and you did move back to England to, to play for Harlow in non-league football at the end of your playing career and while you were there it sounds like you you kind of lent some of your experience in, into coaching some of the younger guys and establishing the the academy which since retiring from football you carried on as you left off at Harlow with the with with that coaching so now you're the CEO of Goldstep Football Academy and uh, CEO of Inner Management 2 in, in Senegal You've also done some punditry for Ugandan TV uh, for some football coverage. But, but what does your day-to-day -day life look like at the moment, Ibrahima? Do you, do you get to make it back to Reading and the Majeski ever? Have you, have you been to visit Ivar and Brynjar in, in Iceland at all? What, what keeps you busy? Yeah, no, um, my daily, yeah, I'm, I'm between uh, literally Belgium where I live now and, uh, and Senegal, uh, flying in and out. I'm in Senegal now. You know, I just got there literally uh, Monday yesterday so um so yeah i just i just literally traveled the world especially africa and uh to, to seek for talent you know young talent and everything you know i i do think that uh, i mean i think that 
young Africans, because I am African before everything, uh, need help. You know, because the, the condition, uh, the condition they have here, life is very difficult for them, and uh, football is a uh, is an escape for them. So uh, we kind of try to bring as much as we can in Europe, the good, the better ones. You know, the one we can help. And at the same time, I got my academy because I feel uh, where I got my academy is just social, really. You know, um, it's like uh, the suburb of the of Dakar. You know, people are very poor. You know, the only thing they got is football. Uh, kids are not going to school. You know, so I created that academy literally to give them a structure to not have anything to do all day and end up on the street doing nothing. So uh, we got that academy, and I think we had about 90 kids, you know, playing football like all morning, and uh, that, that's 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 cool. That's cool. I'm I'm here now because uh, we getting a, a club. We're gonna buy a club now, and we're gonna try to take it a bit more serious. So um, I'm probably gonna be leaving the agency world because obviously I'm gonna be a president of that club, so I won't be able to combine the two work. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a different thing, but that's my daily, really. I just go around, you know, and watch football most of the time, in, you know, Belgium, England, and everything. So that's what I do. When it comes to Reading, I'm still in good terms with them. I'm actually going back there on the 25th of this month uh, to watch them play. But I was there in July. We played a friendly game, you know, uh, with the older 106 team, and uh, the second team who got promoted. So, yeah. Still contacting them a lot, I still follow them a lot, you know, still a big fan of them. And so yeah, no, that's cool. That's cool. That's what I'm doing is everything I do is related to football. It's uh, it's been like thirty years of my life, so uh, it's very difficult to give it up. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. And it all sounds very exciting, Ibrahim. I hope all goes well with um, this club that you're going to be getting involved in. Um, Spurs have a young Senegalese player at the moment called Pape Matassar, who I'm excited about. But I wanted to quickly ask, are there any um, up-and-coming players that you're working with um, in Africa at the moment that you'd like to name drop here? Anyone we should be looking out for the next stars of the future? Uh, there, is a, there is a young... Uh... Liberian striker uh, from Liberia, and uh, he's a bit like Oshiman the way he plays. You know, he's very quick, powerful, and uh, I think he's got a good chance. Let's put it. Uh, I like him a lot. There is a uh, in Senegal. There is a young right back, and uh, I really think he's, he's top class. You know, and uh, I'm like literally, I try all summer to get people to buy him, but they all saying there is every club I talk to really good but right now we don't need that position he's just 18 and he's actually at the African Cup for Senegal now U20 and uh, I really do think that he's going to be one of yeah one of the best right back I've seen for a long time you know what I mean so uh, so yeah in Africa that's all for me really they, they, they're the two I really think that they will I mean we got all the players who I think they will have they will go on and have life you know in football and be successful but them two are proper, proper class, you know what I mean? So hopefully, I'm trying now to get them to England because they're both 2004, so they just teach uh, to England, sorry, to the world because they just turned 18. But uh, them two are really good, really, really good. Fantastic. Well, I hope to see them both at Tottenham in the um, not-too-distant future. We'll see. We'll see. But that's yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> that's a good place for us to end um, the interview today. So, yeah, um, from both Kaito and myself, a massive thank you to you, Ibrahim. It's been so much fun speaking to you, and it's been really interesting too. And um, just before we end, Ibrahim, um, how can um, our our listeners best follow you? Do you have any social media accounts for any of your business ventures or for yourself? What's the best way for people to keep in keep up to date with Ibrahim Asonko? Yeah, I mean, uh, for a time I was a lot on Instagram. Lately, not you know, for the last four, five, six months, I've not been on Instagram. Uh, Twitter, but I'm not really posting anything. I just read the news. <laughs> but uh, with the new project, we uh, we just gonna literally try to take it like another dimension because I've got uh, as partner I've got uh, Patrice Demba City, the old Newcastle player, and uh, yeah, and we really trying to build something special in Senegal. So uh, hopefully we will uh, we'll 
we'll have an Instagram for that team and everything. And I think that's when we are really going to be active on the social media. But when it comes to personal stuff, you know, my wife, <laughs> I would say follow my wife because she posts, <laughs> she posts more of myself than anyone else in the world. So, uh, yeah, but that's it. That's, that's pretty much the whole thing. Well, thanks again, Ibrahim. Best of luck with everything that you're up to on the, the football scene in, in Senegal. It sounds quite exciting for you at the moment. Um, good Thank partnership you. as well between you and Papis um, getting involved in this club. So I'm sure you'll have uh, success. Probably no, no betting company as the sponsor on the kit. Uh, I'm sure Papis won't mind me referencing that. That was a bit of a, a saga during his time uh, in England. Um, but yeah. best wishes as well to, uh, to your family, to your wife, um, to the rest of the family, Ibrahima. For our listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, as my dog for the first time uh, chooses the end of the podcast to make a bunch of noise. Yeah, please stop. Thank you. Um, but uh, as far as our listeners, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do subscribe wherever it is that you like to stream your favorite podcasts. Just search for United Mates Football Podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. We are at United Mates FP, so give us a follow on those two. And if you feel like putting any faces to these voices, you can also find us on YouTube. Just look for the United Mates Football Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe while you're at that. For everything in one place, we've got the website, unitedmatesfp.com. Until next time, everyone. I think my dog will make an appearance. Come here, but here it comes. There's the big boy. All right. Until next time, everyone. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.